In American politics, the center is dead. The election we passed through in 2016 exposed once again the depth of division and also a level of discourse where compromise has been a dirty word. And how did we get to such an extreme state of polarization? Is it something about the internet? Or is it about the kinds of people who go into politics? Or is it, as some have argued, the strange American practice known as gerrymandering, where every 10 years, the parties redraw the political map to create an advantage for themselves by putting together districts made up overwhelmingly of voters likely to support them, making their seats so safe and so uncompetitive that they have no incentive to compromise, and the center dies. Well, that is an intriguing theory, but does it hold up to examination? That sounds like the makings of a debate, so let's have it. Yes or no to this statement, gerrymandering is destroying the political center. A debate from Intelligence Squared US. We are at George Washington University in Washington, DC, in partnership with the National Constitution Center with four superbly qualified debaters on stage who will argue for and against the motion, gerrymandering is destroying the political center. As always, our debate will go in three rounds, and then our live audience here in Washington votes to choose the winner, and only one side wins. Let's go to those keypads and have you vote now as you come off the street on this motion. Gerrymandering is destroying the political center. If you go to the keypad, take, pay attention to keys number one, two, and three. If you agree with the motion, push number one. That means you're arguing with this side. You agree with this side's argument. If you disagree with the motion, push number two. And if you are undecided, push number three. You can ignore the rest of the keys. They're not live. And if you push the wrong key, just correct yourself and your, your last vote will be recorded before we lock out the system. And I'm judging by eye contact that we're done. Okay, and what I want to explain is that at the end of the debate, after you have heard the arguments and judged their quality and persuasiveness, we will have you vote again. And what we do is we look at the difference between the first vote and the second vote, and it's the difference between the two votes that determines our winner. It's the team whose numbers have moved up the most in percentage points who will be declared our victor. Again, our motion is this, gerrymandering is destroying the political center. We have one team arguing for, one team arguing against. Let's meet the team first arguing for the motion. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Daly. Hi, David. Hello. So you wrote a book whose name uh, I'm not allowed to say on the radio or, <laughs> or in front of small children, so I will try to get around it. You, you, the name of the book is Ratf, and it ends in K-E-D, the true story behind the secret plan to steal America's democracy. What, what exactly does that term that I can't pronounce mean? Well, I like to uh, quote the great political philosophers of ACDC and talk about uh, dirty deeds done dirt cheap. It is a term that goes back to Watergate. You can trace it back through the redistricting battles of the 1990s um, as a, a term for a political chicanery. Um, and in this most vulgar of years, it seemed like a good way to cut through the system and uh, grab people's attention for a topic that might have put you to sleep in civics class back in eighth grade. Some time-honored profanity. <laughs> All right. Rat bleeped. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, David. And please tell us who your partner is. I am debating this evening with my friend, Caroline Fredrickson. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Caroline Fredrickson. Hi, Caroline. Welcome to Intelligence Squared US. And you are president of the American Constitution, Constitution Society for Law and Policy, a progressive group. And we are wondering, again, we're going to need a lot of background mm -hmm. throughout the evening. For those of us not so familiar with gerrymandering, we know that both parties do it. They have been doing it for a few centuries. Mm -hmm. um, but does that mean that, technically speaking, it's legal? It's not. Um, in fact, the Supreme Court has recognized that drawing lines to prevent a legislature from being, quote, collectively responsive to the popular will is actually unconstitutional and has questioned partisan gerrymandering. Uh, so no, it's not. So how do we get to a point where it's happening anyway? Well, this, as uh, I think um, people might uh, consider some of the Supreme Court decisions a little vague, um, and that's because they haven't figured out the standard to how to evaluate when, uh, when the line has been crossed. Okay, and that's why we have a debate here tonight. Thank you, uh, and the team welcoming for the motion.
I think I just misspoke, so I get the chance to rewind and do things over again, so I'm just going to say thank you to the team arguing for the motion. <laughs> and you have two opponents. Please welcome arguing against the motion first, Chris Jankowski. Uh, Chris, you're actually a major character in your opponent's book. Um, you are, ran a program called Red Map on behalf of the Republican State Leadership Committee, uh, pulling off what many say was the most successful gerrymander of all time on behalf of the Republican Party. Rachel Maddow called you the unsung political genius of our time. And all of this was your idea. Where, where did that idea come from? Well, uh, good evening. Um, I would say... Uh, and I, it's only going to go downhill from here, <laughs> based on Rachel's billing. But, uh, you know, I hate to, the worst part about David's book is it outed me as a New York Times reader. <laughs> and I was reading a Sunday story in July 2009 that uh, mentioned the upcoming uh, census ongoing and the redistricting and reapportionment that would take place and the significant changes in populations from the Rust Belt down to the Sun Belt and that state legislatures would be doing these lines. And that, of course, I knew that from college poli-sci probably, but I, um, I thought, you know what, we can, we can do something. So you moved. We did. And who was your partner? Well, um, I believe you take a gun to a gunfight, and I think you take an Ivy League professor to a debate. <laughs> so I brought Nolan McCarty. Ladies and gentlemen, Nolan McCarty. Nolan, it is Princeton indeed. You're uh, chair of the Department of Politics there, um, and you've been studying politics and wrote a book called Polarized America, which looks at the causes and the results of polarization in American politics. But if, are we being misty-eyed to look back to the past and say it's never been as bad as it is today? Well, uh, we have measures of polarization in Congress going back to Reconstruction. Reconstruction is a pretty nasty time. Uh, we had just finished the Civil War. One party believed that the other party consisted of traitors. Uh, it's worse now. Wow. <laughs> okay, we got a heck of a debate coming up. Ladies and gentlemen, the team arguing against the motion, which once again is gerrymandering, is destroying the political center. Let's move on to round one. Round one comprised of opening statements by each debater in turn. They will be six minutes each. They will be uninterrupted. And here, speaking first, to get you to vote yes on the motion, gerrymandering is destroying the political center, Caroline Fredrickson. She is president of the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy. Ladies and gentlemen, Caroline Fredrickson. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me here. Um, so I was, I was asked to, to start off with a little bit of the, the legal framework. Why do we actually do this? Um, so some of you may know that, uh, that our Constitution requires that states uh, redraw our congressional and state legislative district lines every 10 years. Um, and as our country grew after its founding, it didn't grow equally, as you might guess. Some towns and counties grew larger than others. Um, and some jurisdictions actually took account of that and changed their district lines, um, but others didn't. So for an example, um, uh, in Tennessee from 1901 to 1961, the legislature just ignored the requirement to redraw district lines. Another example, in Alabama, you had, uh, in addition to the literacy tests and poll taxes that kept African Americans from registering to vote, you had malapportionment that helped preserve the power of segregationists in places like Lowndes County, Alabama. In that county, you had 15,000 approximately residents who had as many representatives in the Alabama Senate as the 600,000 residents of Birmingham's Jefferson County. Well, the Supreme Court ended this perversion of democracy in a series of landmark cases in the 60s, uh, ruling that legislative districts had to be roughly equal in population. Uh, they're known as the one-person, one-vote cases. Um, and so district ba boundaries now are being readjusted to account for new population information. And so when the census is conducted at the start of the new decade, district boundaries have to be re redrawn. And so we have this redistricting and, and gerrymandering. So as, as you know, the gerrymandering is nothing new. Um, it's named after uh, Elbridge Gerry, who was the Massachusetts governor and future vice president, who in 1812 signed a redistricting plan that benefited his own party. It looked a lot like a salamander, and hence the gerrymander. 
Um, but just because it was done in the past doesn't make it any less insidious and any less anti-democratic. And now we have these sophisticated technologies and maps uh, that allow it to become uh, so much worse. And as you know, maps uh, and are, tend to be drawn by the state legislators. Legislators are very self-interested in this process, and this gives them the tools to figure out exactly what they want their own district and their own voters to look like for the next 10 years. And because uh, they are, uh, the parties have learned that they can gain many votes by altering the mix of who votes rather than assuming the median positions of the likely electorate. And they can speak more directly to partisans and donors, uh, the extremes really, be through the micro-targeting that is available to them. And these base voters are then the key to the primary. With districts that are configured like this to benefit the incumbent or one party, the primary becomes the only thing that matters. And so you can look in 2012 and 2014 where you had partisan asymmetry that was at its highest level in 40 years. And that's measured by how one party can get more seats than its votes should allow. The districts are structured not to be competitive. <laughs> so as I mentioned, the Supreme Court has, has raised concerns about uh, partisan gerrymandering as being unconstitutional, as not when the districts are not collectively responsible to the popular will. And the reason for this is that the redistricting requirement was essentially was meant to create fairness and balance. The districts were created, the, re, the drawing was, was meant to keep them fair and the populations balanced. And not, and I will quote from a, a piece that was in the Washington Post uh, uh, by Phil Andrews, a former uh, county councilman in Montgomery County, Maryland. He said the third district of Maryland staggers like a drunken sailor from Annapolis to Olney. And you'd have to look at it, and you can see it actually does kind of look like a drunken sailor staggering. Um, that's not what the founding fathers were intending when they said that we should have this uh, process go on. Madison actually said that the House was meant to be a numerous and changeable body, where the members would have a, quote, habitual recollection of their dependence to the people. Madison said, Every new election in the states will change one half of the representatives. Well, as you know, we have elections where almost nobody in the House changes unless they'd happen to retire. So we can see that we have a situation where the gerrymandering has significantly added to the level of polarization. You have districts that have no competition and hence the only the incumbent runs for re-election because it's really not worth it for anybody else. There are so few competitive districts. And that leads to disincentivizing dialogue because there's no reason to talk to somebody on the other side of the aisle because if you do and you compromise, you'll have a primary attack. And the primary, as I mentioned, is the only election that matters. So I would just uh, end with a couple other points about why uh, this has contributed so significantly to the destruction of the middle. When there's only one person on the ballot or only one party that can win a district, the citizens are essentially have no way to hold that individual accountable. They have no choice. As a result, people stop voting. Turnout goes down. And let me remind you that primaries, and since primaries are often now the only vote that matters, Primaries are already a low turnout operation, exaggerating even more how far to the extreme and out of the middle both the voters are and those uh, people who are responding to them, the elected officials. So I just want to quote, uh, to close, uh, in the same uh, set of articles yesterday in the Washington Post, there was an expert, Ross Lawrence, from the American Enterprise Institute, a Republican, who talked about why it was why it is that competitive elections are good for voters. He reminds us that one party dominance is a recipe for corruption and complacency. So I ask you, give us your vote, because it's clear that gerrymandering is destroying the political center. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline Fredrickson. And that is the motion, gerrymandering is destroying the political center. Here to get you to vote no on this motion, I want to bring to the lectern Nolan McCarty. He is the Susan Dodd Brown Professor of Politics and Public Affairs at Princeton. 
I allowed your opponent to go over 30 seconds. If you need it, you'll get the same uh, privilege. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Nolan McCarty. At the heart of tonight's debate is the question of whether gerrymandering can be blamed for what political scientists and others have called polarization. For our purposes tonight, polarization can be thought of as the disappearance of moderate views from politics and the increased likelihood of extreme ones. Uh, the system often manifests itself in uh, its extreme differences between uh, the two parties. Uh, polarization can appear uh, at two different levels. It can appear among elites, like in Congress, so we see the hollowing out of uh, moderates in Congress, or it can happen in the electorate, where we see the disengagement of moderate voters. The conventional wisdom among political scientists is that polarization uh, is primarily an elite phenomenon, at least it started there, and it's, that's most clear in the data. Uh, voter polarization emerged much later and is more empirically ambiguous and is often driven by elite behavior. Uh, I am going to focus on the extent to which gerrymandering is related to elite polarization. My partner will take up questions of voter polarization. My focus on Congress has two, uh, at least two advantages. First, it's well studied and there's a historical uh, record of congressional voting on bills. Uh, and polarization in Congress is obviously directly pertinent to questions about the effects of gerrymandering. So let me start with just giving you some data and some facts about polarization in Congress. So in my work, I've measured polarization in Congress by levels of partisanship and ideological division on roll call votes on legislation. These measures have varied greatly over 140 years since Reconstruction, which I mentioned before. It was obviously high during Reconstruction in the Gilded Age through about 1920. It was low from the 1930s to the 1970s, and a dramatic growth began in the late 1970s. And as I said before, now we're at an all-time high. Second fact, the House and the Senate have polarized more or less in tandem. There's no significant differences between the trends and the turning points between uh, those two chambers. Uh, and the data also suggests that the trends are very long term with very few abrupt changes, reflecting the obvious role of deep cultural changes, economic and technological shifts, uh, and demography. Given these long term trends, I argue that it's very doubtful that any small change in electoral procedure, such as the way we draw districts, can really account for what's going on. Uh, so the first point I want to make in, uh, in support of that argument is to go to the theoretical argument that people have made about how it is that gerrymandering is supposed, partisan gerrymandering is supposed to increase polarization. I would argue it's very important not to conflate partisan gerrymandering, the attempt that uh, majority parties uh, do to try to maximize the number of seats, and incumbency protection gerrymandering, uh, the role that incumbents might play in creating safe seats. They're not the same and they're very different. So let me give you uh, an example to show how the argument underlying this case doesn't make any sense. So consider a state with two districts, and we'll say that party A has an advantage across the state. Say they get 53% of the vote, so they're a slight majority party. They get to draw the district boundaries and can do so to get any allocation of partisans into districts. In such a scenario, party A has essentially two choices. One, it can do the partisan gerrymandering. It can create two identical districts so that it gets 53% in both of those districts. Or it can do incumbency protection. It can create a safe party A district and a safe party B district. Now note that the one with the safe districts is the incumbency protection gerrymandering. It's not the partisan gerrymandering. The partisan gerrymandering gives the incumbents of the majority party much narrower margins than the incumbency protection. So it's really not, uh, it's really not uh, partisan gerrymandering. Uh, its effects on polarization just aren't clear theoretically. But I'm an empiricist, so let me talk a, li a little bit about the data against the proposition. First of all, as I've already alluded to, the Senate. Since the Dakotas were split in the 1890s to give the, the Republicans four senators instead of two, the Senate has not been gerrymandered, yet the data show it's just as uh, polarized as the House of Representatives. Small states can't be gerrymandered. They're states with one member of Congress. They send uh, extreme members to Congress all the time. Recall uh, a certain Vermont senator uh, was a socialist until he became a Democrat. That's from a state with one House member. 
If you look at state legislatures, lower and upper chambers are equally polarized. Lower chambers are easy to gerrymander than upper chambers. Why are they the same uh, if this is uh, what's going on? Uh, turns out, if you look at the geography, extreme partisan districts are no more frequent than extreme counties. So the underlying geography of the United States is one that's quite polarized, and the districts themselves are not much more polarized than the underlying geography. And then finally, and most importantly, uh, polarization uh, does not seem to increase disproportionately around reapportionment years. It increases in off years every year. In fact, since 1977, it's increased every year, and the increases around reapportionment are no bigger uh, than they are around other years. Uh, just a few other points of uh, more so perhaps sophisticated evidence. Uh, it's important to note that since the 1970s, the main growth in polarization measured by the differences between the parties and their voting records has been the polarization that's occurred in partisan competitive districts. It's not because there are fewer competitive districts. Even in those districts where Democrat and Republican voters are at roughly equal strengths, they send members of Congress who are just as polarized as the other types of districts. Finally, uh, more sophisticated evidence based on simulations where we can simulate any type of districting we want, partisan incumbency gerrymandering, this type of gerrymandering versus that type of gerrymandering shows it has very, very little effect uh, on levels of polarization. Uh, so I conclude based on the theory, which I don't think makes any sense, and the data, which doesn't support it, that the proposition should be rejected. Thank you, Noel McCarty. And a reminder of what's going on, we are halfway through the opening round of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan. We have four debaters, two teams of two, fighting it out over this motion, gerrymandering is destroying the political center. You have heard the first two opening statements, and now on to the third. Standing at the lectern is um, um, uh, David Daly, who is author of the book uh, Rat Eft. The True Story Behind the Secret Plan to Steal America's Democracy. He's also a publisher of the Connecticut Mirror. He will get, uh, be up here trying to persuade you to vote yes. Please welcome David Daly. I want to tell you all a story about what happened in Florida in December of 2010, just a few weeks after upwards of 60% of the state's voters in 2010, a big Tea Party year, voters couldn't agree on much of anything in 2010. They did back two constitutional amendments mandating that all redistricting be conducted without any partisan intent. It did not take but a couple of weeks for the smartest Republican strategists in the state, guys who run firms like data targeting and strategic direction, guys who make deep into six figures every year to, to do things like be a redistricting coordinator, to gather at GOP headquarters in Tallahassee with legislative leaders and top aides and bold-faced names from Washington. The goal, launching a sophisticated and highly concealed campaign to run two redistricting processes in Florida, one public, one in the shadows, both in their control and loaded with partisan intent. They might have gotten away with it, except the lawsuit brought by the reformers uncovered the meeting's agenda. Questions like communication with outside lawyers. How can we make that work? Evolution of maps. Should they start less compliant and evolve through the process? Or should the first map be as compliant as possible and then change very little? A furious federal judge in 2014 declares several of these districts unconstitutional, orders new maps in light of a conspiracy to manipulate and influence redistricting that made a mockery out of the claim transparency and tainted the process with improper partisan intent. Why, if the professor and his tables about partisanship and polarization are correct, would these highly accomplished and highly paid strategists and elected officials take such risks as to violate constitutional amendments? Perhaps the politicos know something truer about the district lines. Something like this that all components of a successful congressional race, including recruitment, message development, and resource allocation, rest on the congressional district lines, and this was an area where Republicans had an unquestioned advantage. Those are not my words. Those come from the triumphant 2012 annual report of Chris Jankowski's Republican State Leadership Committee, a victory lap after his party retained a 33-seat majority in the House that year, despite 1.4 million fewer votes thanks to their audacious reinvention of the oldest political trick in the book, the gerrymander, and a strategy called Red Map. 
We are here to ask whether gerrymandering has destroyed the political center. Yes, it did. The center has been an endangered species for some time, yes. But its destruction accelerates in 2010 and 2011, just as Republicans take what Harvard political scientist Theta Scotchball describes as the biggest lurch in one direction, the right, since anyone began recording legislators' voting records and a deep electoral discontent settled into our politics. We all know that this is true. The center has been erased with the click of a mapmaker's mouse. It's been drawn away. We are a 50-50 nation, but an uncompetitive one, dominated at the legislative level by the rule of one party. The gerrymander is at the root of it. Democrats have taken the popular vote in six of the last seven elections. Ballot splitting reached a 100-plus year low in 2012. And yet, for the last six years, Republicans have claimed their biggest sustained congressional majorities ever, even in years when they get fewer votes. Since 2010, they've also ended parity at the state legislative level. They now control 67 of 98 state legislative chambers and hundreds more seats than Democrats. So why is it that despite regularly winning a majority of voters, Democrats have no power? It is because Chris understands something his partner wants to dismiss. When you draw the lines, you make the rules. And when you draw the lines with the breathtaking technological tools available today, you make the rules for a decade, and these rules changed forever in 2010 with a red map. Now Chris masterminded this strategy in 2009 and 2010 with the stated goal of flipping state legislatures, ensuring Republicans would be the only people in the room when the new district lines were drawn in 2011. The rationale was straightforward, he writes, or a red map's report writes, controlling the redistricting process in these states would have the greatest impact on determining how both state legislative and congressional district boundaries would be drawn. Drawing new lines in states with the most redistricting activity presented the opportunity to solidify conservative policy making and maintain a Republican stronghold in the House for the next decade. This is how you destroy, even nullify the center and advance your agenda in a 50-50 polarized world. It's polarization that has made extreme gerrymandering so effective. When we are as polarized as this, the most essential element becomes where you draw the lines, how you distribute the voters. This is how the center gets destroyed, how National Journal can find 137 congressional centrists in 2002 and four in 2012. It's how Nate Silver can find 133 swing districts to 35 between 1992 and 2012. This plan works better than Republicans even expected. They were able in 2011 to draw 193 of the 435 districts themselves after the 2010 elections. Democrats had complete control over just 44. This election year, we were down to 37 competitive seats. Destroying swing districts and gutting these last outposts of centrism and debate is the goal. You could blame polarization for this, you could blame geography for this. You could blame partisanship for this. Or you can simply take the Republicans at, at their word. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David Daly. Our motion again, gerrymandering is destroying the political center. And here to make his argument against this motion to get you to vote no is Chris Jankowski. He's a political strategist and former executive director of the Red Map Project at the Republican State Leadership Committee. Please welcome Chris Jankowski. Thank you. I've, I was briefly a prosecutor before I became a career political hack, and what David just did reminds me of when a prosecutor gets up and starts throwing out all kinds of unflattering uh, information to the jury, but it isn't really relevant to the charges. And, and so I completely plead guilty to everything he just laid out, and that was playing by the rules and maximizing the impact on the American political system. But the question before you is does gerrymandering cause the polarization, which is a, uh, destroying the American center? And so what I want to talk about is the fact that the swing voter in America has been disappearing for the last 20 years and has just reached a, we've just reached a new height in that. I would point you to a New York Times article in August of 2012 written by Rebecca Berg, and she looked at all the academic research available at that time. She interviewed experts on both sides of the aisle, and she concluded that even among so-called self-identified swing voters in America at that time, half of them vote for one party or the other party all the time. 
they want to identify themselves as not being affiliated with a particular party, but if you look at their actual voting behavior, half of them are already have a team. They have a jersey on, they just have a coat over. Um, and so I think that's important. And if you take that, say, say there's 10 or 15% is the uh, typical national number of swing voters. We talk about playing this game between the 40 yard lines, et cetera. You take half of that and say it's seven and a half percent. And you take that and you ignore California and Texas and some of the bigger states that skew one way or the other and you try to apply it to our electoral system in the battleground states. And from what I can tell, you got about 500,000 households that are really up for grab in a national election. And, and that to me is polarization. I mean, we have gotten to the point where we have our jerseys and we put them on come election time. We try not to, but by the time the election rolls around, we have them on for the most part. The other thing to point out is uh, Pew has done quite a bit of research the last 25 years. They do this value study. They've updated it 14 times. In 2014, they issued a report that's called the polarization in the American public. And one of the things they cited in there, a couple, couple points I want to leave you with. First is the number, the percentage of voters in America who who had uh, who identify solely and extremely with the liberal or conservative view has doubled from 10 to 21 percent. When you extrapolate that out to likely voters, and it's a bigger part of the electorate. But what really got me was that the percentage of voters who believe that the other party that they oppose that they threaten the well-being of the nation. That's the wording of the question. The well-being of the nation. That percentage has doubled. 37% of Republicans felt that way in 14, and 27% of Democrats. That's over 60% of the voters. Six in 10 Americans think that the other party, should they get complete control, would threaten the very foundations of the country, the well-being. And I'm not even one of them. But Six and ten. So we start with a very small, narrow path if you want to talk about who the swing voters, who's actually persuadable and who switches. I'm not saying they don't exist, but if you look at the data, that was from 1994 to 2004. In 20 years, we got more polarized, and it had nothing to do with the gerrymandering that took place after 2010. I mean, it just does, doesn't. I mean, you cannot look at 20 to 25 years of history and a clear trend and then say, oh, but these last few years have made the difference. Uh, the other part is I'd like to talk about briefly is what I actually do, which is uh, a political consultant and run campaigns. And another thing I see in voter behavior, and voters are, are, are the consumers that we as consultants and, and politicians are trying to uh, gain, and they have siloed themselves off in America in self-reinforcing silos through social media, through where they live and who they associate with, and through obviously the you know, notorious cable news networks. And so that voters across the spectrum are getting what they wanna hear, they block out what they don't wanna hear, and that has further, I would argue, created this polarization in the data that, I, uh, that Pew has picked up on. That all that technology and social media, it's just gone up. And, and for people like me, we take advantage of that. Yes, we do a poll at the beginning. We do research and we do polling and we, before we start a race and we look at how we're gonna build that 51%. But then we start slicing and dicing it. And we say, how are we gonna talk to that group of voters without this group of voters seeing it? What goes on TV is usually the last thing. It's the least efficient cost uh, in a campaign and in terms of the marginal votes that it can change. And it's the least important. Today's elections are about turning out the people that already agree with you. And, we've, and I'll touch on that in the conclusion later. Uh, finally, just a show of hands, um, how many members of the NRA are here today? None. All right, well, I'll keep my hand up. So if you're not a member of the NRA, you've never been subjected to the deluge of phone calls, uh, stuff on your phone, social media, online outreach, mailbox, door knocks, with strong Second Amendment issues. Um, but the, I can assure you it goes on, and because the NRA wouldn't admit it, but the, in most instances the gun issue probably works against them net-net, um, they are still very effective because of all the tools and the trends that I just mentioned at motivating those single-issue voters. And I would submit to you that that happens with every segment of the electorate. Both parties have their different blocks they have to get out and how to talk to them. The key is to do it without, the, making the other side 
uh, notice or get excited. And that's polarization, folks. Thank you, Chris Jankowski. And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where our motion is gerrymandering is destroying the political center. Now we move on to round two, and in round two, the debaters address one another directly, and they also take questions from me and from you and our live audience here at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. The team arguing for the motion, Caroline Fredrickson and Dave Daly, they have told us that politics work best when there is competition, but that gerrymandering takes competition out of the equation, creating safe seats where being extreme does not cause uh, politicians' votes, and so that the only election ultimately that matters will be the primary. That as a result of this, there is a disincentive to dialogue, a disincentive to compromise. They say that the center has been drawn away by partisan map makers. The team on the opposite side that wants you to vote against this motion, Nolan McCarty and Chris Jankowski, they agree that our politics is polarized and possibly even broken, but they don't think that that has much to do with gerrymandering. Their evidence um, shows that politicians are uh, taking their positions, sometimes extreme positions, uh, regardless of how safe their seats are, and reflects actually a polarization in the electorate itself. They say it's the underlying geography that determines polarization, that the swing voters have been vanishing on their own, and that as for the rest, they are separating themselves into silos, and that is the source of polarization. I want to go first to the team arguing for the motion, start with Caroline Fredrickson. One point your opponents made in terms of, uh, in, in terms of refuting your gerrymandering, gerrymandering argument as destructive to the political center is that they cited the fact that the Senate, the US Senate, is likewise highly polarized, but it's not a body whose districts are defined by gerrymandering. They're defined by state borders. What's your response to that? Well, I actually think we've seen more um, uh, effort uh, at compromise in the Senate um, than we have in the House, certainly. I'd say one fact is that the control of the Senate has actually changed hands between the parties more often since the 80s than the House has. Um, so uh, clearly, it's the, the, the fact that the, the districts are more uh, uh, competitive to some extent um, uh, in, in the Senate is a reflection of uh, an easier uh, ability to, to, to have uh, more debate. Um, and the Senate is the place where they have actually tried to work together on some issues. Um, immigration reform, where you had Marco Rubio uh, 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 working across the aisle. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, I worked in the Senate for 10 years, and I think it was definitely, it's a place where there, you had the, the gang of 14. Um, you don't see anything like that in the House, um, where um, they just talk to each other. One side only talks to each other. And some of the, some of the most extreme behaviors have been uh, in the House. Okay, so Nolan McCarty, your, your point about the Senate being refuted by Caroline Fredrickson, who's saying that, in fact, the Senate does, does have more of a functional center than the uh, House. I think she just made a wonderful argument for the filibuster. The reason why we see much more bipartisan cooperation in the Senate, despite the polarized differences, is because the minority party always has the opportunity to block legislation through the filibuster. I believe if we got rid of the filibuster, you'd see uh, just as much partisanship in the Senate as you would see in the House, uh, and I, which is sort of consistent with the data. Uh, I would you know, also just point out, uh, you know, that also doesn't deal with the small state problem. Uh, if you look, small state representatives who've never been gerrymandered, they take very extreme positions. They're no different than those from large states, which presumably might have been gerrymandered. Caroline, you want to respond to that? Well, you know, I think the Senate certainly has its own um, unique uh, elements to it. Um, and the fact that there's generally been polarization uh, in the country uh, doesn't mean that on these that there isn't more polarization due to gerrymandering and the fact that the House is more polarized than the Senate. Um, that the Senate was created to be somewhat more conservative um, uh, uh, in its structure from the Constitution, um, having um, every state represented with the same number of, of senators. Um, it has had different rules and anti-majoritarian principles. Um, the filibuster, for example, that I think um, um, have led it somewhat in a different direction. But the fact of the matter is that the House was supposed to be where there was more change going on. As I, as I mentioned, uh, Madison's understanding was that every election you'd, you'd have 50% turnover. Um, and that clearly has not, has not happened. Uh, uh, and we've gotten to a state where the, the incumbents 
uh, have uh, such protection that uh, almost none of them turn over. Chris Jankowski, you want to respond to that? And if not, I have a question for you. I really don't want to respond to that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you a question. Then. Your, your, right. your opponent, um, I think David Daly, anticipated your argument that polarization has been going on for a while, for 25 years, it's a process, by saying, yeah, but it sure has accelerated a whole lot, meaningfully, significantly, as a result of uh, particularly the last round of gerrymandering by the Republican Party. So he's saying it's, it's, it's not the same because it got so much more intense. Your response to that? Well, that's, that's true. I mean, the... It doesn't mean that that's what's caused the polarization, though, in the American electorate as a whole. Uh, but so, the, so let me just interrupt to say, I, I believe he is saying, he is arguing that it's causing it. So can well, you respond? Yeah, he's saying it. He's not proving it, I, is what I would respond. I would say that I've, if you look at the, the uh, research that I cited, it's been a progression since at least 1994 of increased polarization. Uh, but what he's alluding to is accurate. There's, I mean, it's gotten down to an iPad level technology, uh, and the micro target, the, the data on every single one of us that's available, um, and how you can sort voters has just gotten amazingly easier and more precise. And so, yes, the gerrymander is as effective as it's ever been in terms of uh, trying to maintain a majority. That's not the same as protecting incumbents, for sure. Uh, but I, what I don't see is the connection. The, the, there's just a lack of proof that that is causing what we saw in our presidential primaries, where we had the left and the right pull both ways. There was no gerrymandering in that. Um, in any of these Senate governor's races, the presidential race, very polarized electorate, not gerrymandered. David Daly? Chris does a really good job of redrawing the lines, and I think yeah. he just did that a little bit there. Um, <laughs> I think what we want to keep in mind is, he talked a lot about where the swing voters sit. Um, when these lines are being drawn, it's not simply about where the swing voters sit, it's, it's where all the voters sit. So you take a state like Pennsylvania, for example, which in 2012 um, and in 2008, both go for Democratic, if you add up all the votes in the state, for Democratic House candidates in 2008 and 2012, it's about the same 100,000 margin in favor of the Democrats. Um, in 2008, the Democrats win 12 seats. In 2012, they win five seats. Um, did the polarization increase? Did everybody move to Philadelphia? No, the, the, the lines changed in the middle. Um, Democrats get themselves packed into five seats. They win with percentages of 85, 89, 77, 69, and 61, there's one a close race, and the other races get won by margins of 13, 25, 14, 19, 13, 23, 31, 17, 13, 16, and 26. Again, those margins in that many districts in a state that the Democrats get more votes um, and in a year in which there's less ballot splitting than ever before, the lines have a special primacy. And there is academic research on this. You can look to, you can look to Harvard and Theta Scotchball, who has laid out the biggest lurch to the right since political scientists began studying voting records of legislators between 2010 and 2016. You can look at the work of Michael Latner at Cal, at Cal Poly, who takes a look at the seat vote ratio in the 2000s and says that the Republicans have an asymmetry of 3.4 and takes a look at it after 2011 and the asymmetry goes to 9.39. You can take a look at the work that Professors Chen of Michigan and Rodden of Stanford have done when they took a look at those Florida seats that okay, we talked let me, about. Let's let your opponents respond to some of what you're saying, Nolan McCarthy. Yeah, I, I would like to reiterate, there's a really huge conflation in this debate between the idea that the majority party does bad things to maximize its seat share. Uh, they tend to spread their voters out uh, and pack the opposition voters so they can get more seats. That's quite different than saying uh, that politicians intentionally create safe districts and polarize the system. Take a minute for what is the big difference? Well, so again, if we go back to the example I gave in my opening, in opening remarks. If you have a party that's a majority party, uh, they can, they really have two choices. They can kind of spread their voters 
out so that they have a bare or close to bare majority in as many districts as they can, and then they pack uh, the opposition party. Now, the opposition party may be polarized because they're packed, uh, but you're creating a bunch of districts that, if they miscalculate, for example, uh, could go the other way. They're not increasing the safety. A good example, during the notorious mid-decade uh, uh, gerrymandering in Texas uh, in 2003, uh, Tom DeLay uh, actually reduced his district from 57% Republican to 52% Republican. And he almost lost the next election. That is the mechanism behind the partisan gerrymander. It's not making the majority party safer. It's spreading the majority party out in the hopes of winning more seats. All right, Carolyn Fredrickson, that was the second time at, at my request that uh, Noel McCarty explained that point of view, the distinction he's making between incumbent incumbency protection and partisan gerrymandering, which he says in his opening means your theory makes no sense. What's your response? Well, to I that? actually wanted to say there's not these aren't the only options, right? I mean, as as uh, we could actually take this out of the hands of politicians. Um, we've had a number of states that have gone in that direction um, because I think most people agree intuitively with the with the proposition that uh, when politicians decide what the districts look like, it's going to be biased and unfair. And you know, if I could use a commonly used word, rigged. Um, and so, you know, when you create at, when you actually give an independent, nonpartisan body the ability to create maps, they make really different maps. And what happens is that there's actually more competition and that the districts are, then the members are more responsive to the voters. And you can see that how this plays out because when you've had citizen redistricting commissions or these nonpartisan redistricting commissions, you have many more of these districts that have more than one major party on the ballot. Because when you have the non-competitive districts, as I said, the other party doesn't really bother to even run because there's no way to get elected. It's just the primary that matters. And that really changes um, when you have a nonpartisan process. So, I so just, you're saying a, a, you, you, you believe there is a decrease in polarization that can be seen? Can absolutely. Be right, let's take it to the other side. So your opponents are now arguing that a, a, a sort of reverse gerrymandering or a, 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 a more fair redistricting that might lead us away from the pejorative term gerrymandering has, in fact, sh resulted in less polarization. What about that, Chris Jankowski? Well, I think that it's an inherently political function to draw these lines. And if you go back to our founders in the Constitution, they tended to put the inherently political things into the hands of the political people, which would be the, the, the legislative chamber. Uh, let, uh, the legislative branch, if you will. And by political, it's, do you mean an action taken to benefit one party's interests? No, I mean the people who are most uh, accountable to the, to the voters. Okay. And, uh, and subject to that. And so um, I, I'm not against reforming uh, redistricting. I'd just like to see a fair system. Um, I'm not, I don't think this system is necessarily the, the most fair. I think we need uh, some guardrails. Uh, but I, and I think maybe the courts are going to do that personally, but um, I think that this idea that um, there's a such thing as a neutral uh, redistricting process but, but just point, hasn't been Caroline's proven. But Carolyn's point wasn't that there's, at this moment, she wasn't making the argument there should be this process. She is saying that in examples where this process was followed, more competitive districts were created and therefore polarization was reduced. So that's the okay. that's really the question. Do you sure. want to take it? Uh, uh, no, well, actually, or, I, yeah, I think I can. I mean, Arizona has the infamous commission. Just look at the election we just had in Arizona for president. It was racially polarized between the white and non-white vote. It was polarized by uh, income, um, by education levels. Uh, it was just a microcosm of what went on in America, uh, it, and you know. Those folks are, have picked their jerseys, and they have picked their team. And the fact that they're stuck in a particular uh, district, congressional district, that may be more competitive and more, f more uh, fair, if you will, doesn't change that, their behavior. It doesn't make them less partisan. Um, you run a statewide race in Arizona the same way you'd run it in Pennsylvania, which, by the way, Trump won this year. So I think it does defeat some of the, the taint on the redistricting that was done in Pennsylvania. Uh, would you like to respond, David Daly? Yes, I think that Arizona is, is certainly a classic example of a state where nonpartisan redistricting is 
nonpartisan to name only. It's really partisan redistricting just in a, in a smaller room. Um, but what I think we're not getting at here is that incumbent protection gerrymandering is what the Democrats do in, in Maryland, for example, where they get seven out of eight seats that they, they shouldn't have. It should probably be, be a 5-3 delegation if you were to go you know, based on, on fairness. The partisan gerrymandering that we see explode after 2010 is the kind of gerrymandering that takes a state like Michigan where Democrats get 240,000 more votes and packs them into five districts and, give, and gives Republicans nine of the 14 seats. It's taking a 50-50 state like Ohio and making the delegation 12-4. It's taking a state where in 2012 more votes again for Democratic candidates, but the delegation goes 10-3 Republican. Um, and that can't but affect the kind of politics we have. There is still a center in this country. There is still a center where folks, and you can look at the polls, 55% in favor of, of common sense gun control, 50-44 on abortion, should the next president su support or oppose climate change? 69-23. Should we let undocumented immigrants stay who meet certain standards? 72%. There is a center, even on the issues that we are told are the most hot button. Are we getting any action from this Congress on any of these issues? No. So what do you mean by, if you look at our motion, when you say destroying the political center, you don't mean destroying, you don't mean causing those voters not to exist who would held more centrist views, you mean what? I'm saying that we are electing politicians who will not represent the center because they are not accountable to anybody. Uh, uh, I just wanted to add one point mm -hmm. to um, why I agree so much with David's uh, an initial point, is that you have to remember that not only are primaries, as I said, the only election that matters, that they are low turnout, but then in many states where you have unaffiliated voters, they're not allowed to participate in the primary. So you're really seeing a situation where the most partisan people have the most ability to if, if infect or in fact affect the outcome of elections. And the rest of the people who may be independent voters, unaffiliated, or just disgusted by how partisan uh, the person is who's being elected, uh, just opt out. And that means that those people are not having anybody speak for them. I think that would, why you can say that the, the middle um, is being destroyed. Okay, Noel McCarty, I, I let your opponents go twice in a row, so you can do the same, but a lot said by your opponents just now. Do you want to respond to any of it in particular? Uh, yes. So I, I think data is very important for these discussions. I mean, I think we can come up with anecdotes and stories. Uh, it might surprise most people, but the correlation between how extreme a member represents his or her district and how competitive that district is, is almost zero. The Republicans in safe districts and in competitive districts are just as conservative. Democrats who represent safe districts and competitive districts are just as liberal. Uh, so, it, so I agree that, that lots of things can be done by the majority party to skew in favor of them in terms of the number of seats, but whether or not that is actually reducing the number of moderates in Congress, uh, it, it just doesn't uh, jive uh, with the data. Uh, on the point of nonpartisan redistricting, the best example of that is the state of Iowa. In Iowa, a bureau two bureaucrats get in a room and they redivide the state into four quadrants and they just move the boundaries just to make sure the four quadrants are the same. You can't imagine a more technocratic exercise in gerrymandering than that. Uh, but uh, the members of the Iowa delegation are just as uh, extreme uh, within their parties as we would be expected if it were a state that didn't have that. So you're saying the safetyness of your seat has nothing to do, does not correlate with the extremity of a politician's views? Not really. Uh, okay, on the Republican me, me, side, it's zero. On the Democratic side, minority districts are quite different, but let, among non-minority districts, there's bring, almost no correlation. Let me bring that back to your opponents, because it's sort of a direct assault on their premise that there's a little incentive to, um, to compromise whatsoever. But, you're, but you, what, what do you make of that, uh, David Daly? I think the danger here is that what we've created is a system in which there is no way to hold a, a party accountable or individuals accountable. Um, and I look, I look again, I look at, um, and I think that there is, you know, plenty of data here from serious uh, thinkers, whether they're at Stanford or whether they're at Harvard um, or, or many other 
other schools who who have noticed and observed what changes in 2010. Um, it's not it's not necessarily rocket science to see how these lines move and what the result is in our politics. Um, and I I go back to I go back to North Carolina um, and a new district that was drawn for that it was a Democratic district out in the mountains, a part of the state, where Heath Schuler, formerly a, a quarterback here in Washington, uh, played. And they crack Asheville in half, split it in two, um, and it elects a second Republican, a guy named Mark Meadows. And it's Mark Meadows who goes to Washington and essentially is the, is the key driver behind the government shutdown in 2012 is the key driver behind the parliamentary move to oust John Boehner last year. And Mark Meadows would not have been in Congress had that district not have been drawn in that way. That district once sent a conservative Democrat, a moderate Democrat, somebody who opposed Nancy Pelosi. After redistricting, it sends somebody who shuts down the government and goes after the speaker of his own party. All right, I want to go to audience questions now. And the way this will work, um, if, if you, I'll call on you. If you could stand up, we need to hear your voice also through our recording. So please wait for a microphone to be brought to you. There will be people walking around. I'd appreciate it if you would state your name. And if you're um, writing or communicating about this publicly, if, I, if you're a journalist or a blogger, we'd appreciate knowing that. And the last part is I need you to be terse and actually ask a question. Mm -hmm. In the back row, very back row, um, yeah. Uh, no, I, st I was speaking to the, uh, yep, thank you. And if you could stand up so we can see you. Can you just tell us your name, please? Uh, hi, my name is Faith Doyle. Um, I was curious, I'm really unclear as to what your definition of the center is, because it seems like you're talking about either p politicians that we elect that are able to compromise, or is it representation for people who are more or a less, I guess, less okay. politically Gr ideological. Great question. I have a feeling we might hear slightly different answers, but I want to go to Nolan McCarty with the numbers, what you mean by the center, and then I want to go to, um, to uh, Caroline uh, Fredrickson. At one time in the United States House and in the Senate, there were a number of uh, Democrats who compiled more conservative voting records than many Republicans, and many Republicans who cons uh, compiled more liberal voting records than many uh, Democrats. So. There was a center in which the parties were close together and they interacted and they overlapped. Uh, in the data now, is, that's, that's missing. We don't see those sorts of conservative Democrats, liberal Republicans, uh, there's, a, there's a gap. So to use Chris's term, there, were, there was a time when people would put on their jerseys, but they wouldn't always play for the team. Uh, they would occasionally dance with the other, the other side. Oh, we're gonna mix some metaphors here. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so by center, so by the center, you mean being able to cross compromise, vote for not strictly with the party, with the tribe. Um, I don't you know, have any question. disagreement with that. I'd say, you know, from my experience, uh, as I mentioned, I spent you know, a number of years up uh, uh, working uh, in the Senate. I also worked on the House side, and and there was so much more uh, collaboration. Um, certainly, things were partisan. Um, uh, in those days, but uh, the change has been, I think, the fact that there, it's very hard to work across the aisle and not get in trouble. Okay, so by center, then it sounds like we're both talking, we're not talking about the existence of the electorate, we're talking about the behavior of the politicians who are elected. That's what, we, that's what we're talking about. Okay, I hope that clarified. Thank you for that, and thanks for that question. Sir. Uh, hi, my name is Michael. I'm a grad student here in D.C. I wanted to pick up on something that Professor McCarty had, had uh, mentioned earlier, you're talking about the partisan uh, redistricting where the majority party is trying to sort of spread out and they can pack the other party into compact districts. And you said that that might make the other party more polarized, which sounded like it was sort of making uh, the opponent's argument for them. So I wondered if you could uh, clarify that or, or follow up with that. Great question. Sure, sure, that's, qu that's, quite, that's quite possible. But in all of this discussion about the lack of the political center, the notion has been that there are too many Republicans, not that there are too few Democrats and that they're packed into homogeneous districts. Does that answer your question? Well, 
Well, it, it, I mean, if the, argument, if the argument is that homogeneous districts create polarization, the largest number of districts will be less homogeneous because those are the districts held by the majority party. Some districts will be more homogeneous, but by definition of it being the minority party, there'll be fewer of those. Okay, thank you. Right down front here, and wait for the mic to find you. It's coming down the aisle. Hi, my name is Sarah Strader, and I have a question for this side. The, it seems I, that just for those who can't see you, uh, you want to ask for the team for the motion. Yes, thank you. Thank you. It seems a strong correlation has been drawn between gerrymandering and voter polarization, but I wonder if it's possible that the direction of causation could be reversed. So could it be that the shrinking of the political center has itself played a role in causing the recent uptake in dramatic gerrymandering, that partisans don't think they can win over non-existent moderates, so as a result, they then resort to more heavily redistricting? What a fantastic question. Um, David, do you want to take that? And I do want to let the other side respond to that question as well. Sure. David Daly. Um, I think we just saw an election in which lots of states that hadn't flipped in, in many years did flip and, and go the other way. So certainly there are still people out there who are open to persuasion and possibility. Um, what has changed over time is the amount of data that is available to these map makers. And I mean, really 2010 is, 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 um, is ground zero for this. I mean, think about the way you texted in 2000 or even 2003. It was completely different than what you're able to do in 2011 when these map makers draw the lines. Um, and the kind of information that they have, when these maps zig and zag, we used to look at them and say, oh, that's just a funny Rorschach test. It's, you know, it's a drunken sailor. Um, but, you know, I mean, I got out and I drove uh, them as I was writing this book, and you see the purpose and the mission behind them when you are up close. You see the way the neighborhoods change across a street even sometimes, and why those lines are there. And it's because the data is so good that those of us who are persuadable, they know who you are. Those of you who are not persuadable, they've got a pretty good sense of who you are, and they can draw these in such a way that even these districts that look like they're 53, 54, 55, percent districts, that's solid these days because they know who the 53 are. They know if you turn out and they can take all of these public record data sets and, and match them up against, against your consumer preferences, against the census. Okay, let me um, let Chris Jankowski respond as well. well. Sure. First, there weren't a bunch of states that flipped. There were a, a small handful. Um, and what happened in those states? Uh, Wisconsin, Trump won by about 27,000 votes. Turnout was up 124,000 votes from 12. But uh, Clinton got 231,000 fewer votes, 231,000 fewer votes than Obama in 12. And when you look at where those fewer votes came out of, they are Democrat base areas. The base did not come out. It wasn't sure. Trump did a better job in, quote, you know, flipping the map, uh, yes, and bringing the blue collar white voter over. Yes, they turned out more. But the, those kind of numbers are only made up by a complete loss of Democrat-based votes. Same thing at Michigan, 13,000 vote margin roughly right now. They're still going, I believe. That's a 58,000 uh, more voters turned out overall from 12. Three, almost 300,000 fewer votes for Clinton. And when you look at it, and the voter file will be available, but you can already see from the returns that that came from the Democrat base area. So bases. Adjustments in bases are changing these elections and flipping them. Um, and how does, and, how does and what you're saying? How does what you're saying support your point in the in the motion argument of well, the motion? To, to go back to earlier questions and volleys on what how do I define the center? The center is that group of voters in the middle that are willing to go between elections and switch parties uh, based on the candidate. And the objective data that we've provided, the Pew research, shows that six in ten of Americans not only won't switch, they think the other party's going to destroy the country. Um, and it doesn't get that much better for the next 30%. Uh, but, and, and so what I see over and over again, you can talk about the issues without putting a partisan label. You can talk about gun control, you can talk about education, you can talk about school choice, you can talk about abortion, you name it. And you can focus group it, and I have many focus groups. As soon as you start putting partisan labels on it, and a label on that candidate X is a Republican, this is a Democrat, People divide, and that narrow center is very small. That is the polarization. Gerrymandering has been indicted, convicted, and sentenced to life tonight, and fine. It doesn't prove their proposition. 
America is divided and polarized, and you can see it from the last uh, what happened last week. Okay, I want to point out that we have two definitions of center now to go to your question. One, one is about the voters, and one is about the behavior of politicians. So you have to sort that out as you vote. Do you want to respond to that? Because I want to, if, I'm going to go to some more questions unless you'd like to respond. Well, I just, uh, just as a maybe Caroline a slight Fredrickson. corrective is that I think one of the things we don't often connect are the the, the gerrymandering and then what. Uh, legislatures do afterwards and I think what we saw in several of the states um, that Chris was talking about was that the states um, through the redistricting process uh, targeted just a small number of districts and flipped the state house and then immediately moved to put more restrictive voting measures on the ballot um, and then we see how that comes out in this election where you may say that there were that many thousands of voters of votes that uh, people didn't turn out um, we don't know that yet whether they didn't turn out or whether they couldn't turn out. Um, so I think that's just a, a question that remains uh, to be explored. But I, mean, I think the fact of the matter is we all know that in our gut that when people are only talking to people that agree with them, which is what happens in these races now because the districts have been created so that there's only one group of people to talk to and there's only one kind of candidate. Now, that means that, so you're talking about the six and 10 voters who wouldn't switch. I wanna talk about the four and 10. So there's still four and 10, even under your data, there are people that are open. Those are people who want to be talked to by, by people who are going to be reaching compromise, who are going to be trying to find legislative solutions. And I, I think that's exactly where this, this takes us. Can I respond? Yes, yeah. please do. It wasn't my data. Um, Pew says that six and 10, those people are gone, gone. It doesn't mean the four out of 10 are. The uh, New York Times, Rebecca Berg's article, and it determined that half of the self-identified swing voters aren't swing voters. So we're so far from having 40% available. Um, look at your next poll and say, who, who are the swing self-identified ticket splitters, swing voters, and divide that in half. That's your number. That's what's available. I want to remind you that we are in the question and answer section of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan, your moderator. We have four debaters, two teams of two, arguing it out over this motion, gerrymandering is destroying the political center. Nolan McCarty, did you want to get in on that? Okay, I, I can move on to another question. I wasn't sure if you, you can move on. Okay, let's another question right in the center there, sir. Yeah, uh, the gentleman nearer to me. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Jen. I'm a resident of D.C. Um, just curious about perception. If people believe that gerrymandering by the opposite party is causing polarization, and they therefore become polarized due to that belief. So con even conceding that maybe Jerry Murray doesn't have any practical effect, people believe that it causes polarization and become so, doesn't that add to the polarization and therefore the destroying of the middle? Let me um, let Caroline, Thank or you. actually, let's, uh, we haven't heard from you, David, in a while. Is the story of gerrymandering itself causing polarization? Is the narrative about the process of gerrymandering resulting, I think you're saying, in people being hmm. disaffected and causing polarization? It could be. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't have any. I don't have any any data on that um, or any any sense that that's the that that's the case. Um, I mean, I think that there is more awareness of this issue because I think it's happening at every level of our democracy. Um, it's happened not only at the congressional level, but it's happened at the state level in very very deep and dramatic ways. So there are you know plenty of folks in North Carolina where in many years more voters come out for the Democrats, but they live under um, veto-proof majorities for Republicans in their House and their, and their Senate. And I think, Caroline, um, you wanted to join? Yeah, I just want to say, I think it plays into a narrative um, that's pretty pervasive about how dysfunctional Congress is, how dysfunctional politicians are. Um, they become completely unresponsive uh, under this um, uh, uh, under the sort of perception of, of gerrymandering, they're not accountable to us anymore. And that means that people then stop participating, which means that they're even less accountable. So I think the perception um, and the reality are definitely um, self-reinforcing. Nolan McCarty, do you want to respond on that as well? I don't think there's any data on the question. Uh, they've studied uh, voter responses to various uh, electoral laws, such as campaign finance laws, other laws, they find almost no correlation between how strict a state's or how liberal a state's campaign finance law is uh, in the way the voters feel about the system. And, and so I would assume this, it would be the same about gerrymandering. And I'm, and I'm not asking this sarcastically. You're a data guy. So I am a data guy. Narrative, narrative arguments don't carry weight with you very much? 
I, I, I think narratives are nice. They help us to get build intuitions about what might be going on. But at the end of the day, on a question like polarization, which is a description of how millions and millions of voters are behaving and how hundreds and hundreds of legislators throughout the United States are behaving, I think the numbers are really important. Well, I have this to say. This concludes round two of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where our motion is gerrymandering is destroying the political center. And now we move on to round three. I want to remind you that right after round three, you're going to vote a second time. And I want to remind you that the way we determine victory is the difference in percentage points between the first and the second votes. Whoever's numbers go up the most. Round three, closing arguments over this motion, gerrymandering is destroying the political center. These statements will be brief. They will be two minutes each. And first to make her statement in support of the motion to get you to vote yes, Caroline Fredrickson, President of the American Constitution Society. Thank you. Well, I just, I want to tell a little story because I actually think narratives are really important in politics. Um, um, I want to tell you about Dale Schultz, who's a former uh, Republican state representative in Wisconsin. He served 30 years. He's the plaintiff in one of the cases that's moving forward that's challenging partisan uh, gerrymandering as a violation of the Constitution. Um, he served in both the House and Senate uh, of the Wisconsin State House. He was Senate Majority Leader. He retired in 2014 uh, because uh, the environment had become so partisan uh, in, in Wisconsin. And he may be a Republican, but he was critical about how the State House had become so extreme so full of gridlock with no role for moderates. Uh, and when the 2011 districts were drawn, his district was drawn to be way too conservative for a, a moderate like him. So in 2014, he led the effort for nonpartisan redistricting in Wisconsin, but the Republican legislature wouldn't even have hearings. I just want to leave you with his quote. He says, it's just sad when a political party has so lost faith in its ideas that it's pouring all of its energy into election mechanics. We should be pitching as political parties our ideas for improving things in the future, rather than mucking around in the mechanics and making it more confrontational at the voting sites and trying to suppress the vote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline Fredrickson. The motion again, gerrymandering is destroying the political center, and here to make his closing statement against the motion, Nolan McCarty. He is professor and chair of the Department of Politics at Princeton University. Uh, to, thanks. Um, a lot of this has been made of the lack of competitiveness in House elections uh, throughout this debate. Uh, so the question is, is it true? And my answer is yes, with a lot of very large buts. Uh, what first but is that from 2006 to 2010, the House of Representatives suffered the largest three-party swing since the 1930s. So gerrymandering and polarization have been going on for a long time. In recent memory, we have as much turnover over three elections uh, as we've seen since the 1930s. We have measures of competitiveness. How competitive are the districts? They tend to not change very much after reapportionment, but they change a lot mid-decade. There are long trends in competitiveness. They have almost nothing to do with reapportionment. The reason why there's so little uh, competition uh, in House elections has to do with two major realignments that this country has witnessed over the past 30 years. The first, the best known, is the Southern realignment, where we went from a situation in which there was monopoly control of the South by the Democratic Party, uh, and it transitioned to a competitive system where Democrats and Republicans were competitive, and finalized into a situation where the Democratic Party is not very competitive in House elections that are not minority districts. A second realignment is in the Northeast. The Northeast went from a, a uniformly Republican region, for the most part, transitioned to a competitive region where Democrats and Republicans competed, and has become a Democratic stronghold. None of that had to do uh, re realignment. Those are broad uh, trends. And finally, let me make one last point. I think one of the things we learned last Tuesday really reinforces my point. As we all know, uh, Donald Trump lost the popular vote, which appears to now be by 1% or 1.5%, yet won the Electoral College uh, in a pretty substantial way. That's exactly the phenomenon that, that the proponents have been complaining about, that the Republicans are getting more seats than votes. That has nothing to do with gerrymandering. That's just where the American people are 
and where they live. Thank you, Noel McCarty. The motion again, gerrymandering is destroying the political center. And here to summarize his position in support of the motion, David Daly, author of Rat F. Blank, blank, K-E-D, the true story behind the secret plan to steal America's democracy. Here's David Daly. Thank you so much for being here tonight and listening to us. We do have data on what's happened since 2010. We know that the middle has lost 99% of its representation in Congress over these last 20 years. We know that this does not happen by accident or because we have self-sorted ourselves. We have the data from Harvard showing the largest lurch since 2010 in one direction. We have political scientists who often doubt the role of the gerrymander in this, who study the maps that came out in 2010 and call it things like extreme statistical outlier, the most biased I have ever seen, a one in a thousand shot of actually not having partisan intent. We know what has happened both from data and from living through it. I do want to return for a moment to Mark Meadows in North Carolina, because that is what happens on a concrete, specific level when you redistrict a state and you turn a conservative Democrat into a Tea Party Republican. Meadows represents a district that is 75% white, the average is 63. 9% Latino, the average 17. These are the numbers of these districts that the far right that has stopped so much in Congress over the last six years represent. They've drawn them for themselves. This is not about partisanship, this is about democracy. Our elections are not games. Our principles are too important to be subject to every 10 years arms wars over district lines that make our politics more nasty, more negative, way more expensive. We are the only democracy that allows this to happen. We've seen the ferocity with which partisans will fight to keep it. Nothing will change until we take it back. I ask for your support of this motion as a first step. Thank you. Thank you, David Daly. And that motion, one more time, gerrymandering is destroying the political center. And here to summarize his position against the motion, Chris Jankowski, former executive director of the Red Map Project. Thank you. I wasn't going to bring it up, but Caroline brought up Senator Schultz in Wisconsin. Uh, let's talk about that. Uh, Senator Schultz is a, what we would call in our party a known moderate now. Uh, and he was not happy with the results of uh, the elections in 2010, where his party actually took control, and uh, there were more conservative members in his party that had uh, the leadership and the control. He w did not support Governor Walker's budget reform, public union uh, reform, did not support any of that. Uh, but we had a two vote, and Red Map picked up two, a two-seat majority, not just a one in Wisconsin Senate. So we were able to get all that through. What people don't realize is because Scott Walker did win his recall, we actually lost control of the state Senate. Uh, in those recalls. Uh, the first wave in August of 2011, we won. We won. We held on to one seat. We lost a seat. We held on the other seat by 471 votes after $30 million was spent on those state Senate elections. There were t a, a few seats up under Governor Walker the following June, uh, all of this under the old lines. And uh, we actually lost control of the chamber by one vote. But by then, there was going to be new, you know, the new lines had already been passed and they would go into effect. So they picked picked it back up in November. Those lines that uh, were in place through the recalls, though, were passed by Republicans in 2000. Democrats took complete control under them. They lost it back and forth. So I'm not sure that you know Senator Schultz had a lot to complain about, about the gerrymandering in Wisconsin. Uh, but I would also say that the, the state of Wisconsin was galvanized. You were either for Governor Walker or against, and there was no undecided vote. Uh, and that had nothing to do with gerrymandering. It just didn't. So I just want to take a quick minute. How many people know somebody, friend, colleague? I just want you to know you have 12 seconds left. Who, no matter what you tell them about the last election, they were going to stick with their candidate. One person in your life. One person. I would say almost the whole room knows one. Real quick, how many people know two people in their life? All right. That's my point, folks. We Time is up. Polarized. Thank you, Chris Jankowski. And that concludes round three of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where our motion is gerrymandering is destroying the political center.
And now it's time to learn which side you feel has argued the best. I want to ask you again to go to the keypads at your seat. The vote is the same as at the beginning, except now you've heard the arguments. The motion, gerrymandering is destroying the political center. If you agree with the motion, if you want to vote yes, vote with this side, push number one. If you disagree with the motion, you're voting no, you're voting with this side, push number two. If you became or remain undecided, push number three. And just as before, um, we'll have, uh, we'll lock out the vote in about 15 seconds, and then we'll have the result in about a minute. Uh, no more like a minute and a half. Okay, looks like uh, from my contact again, everybody's back with me. So uh, one thing I want to say is, uh, um, you know, I said at the beginning we wanted to devote, dedicate this to Gwen Eiffel, who was uh, the PBS News anchor, NewsHour anchor who passed away today because of her how deeply she represented civility and truth, a search for the facts. I want to congratulate this panel for living up to that. Um, this is, a, as we all know, it's a very tense time. There have been some bad feelings. I felt on this stage what we saw was a demonstration of civility, respect for one another, and a search on both sides for the truth. So I want to congratulate our debaters for the way that you did this. And I also, I want to thank Jeffrey Rosen and the National Constitution Center for partnering with us. You are a terrific partner. The National Constitution Center is an hour and a half train ride from here. It is well worth a visit. I mean, it is really well worth a visit up in Philadelphia. Uh, Intelligence Squared US is a nonprofit organization. Um, I know that uh, you paid ticket prices to get in here, but ticket prices don't come close to covering what it costs us to, uh, to do this program in the cities that we do it in. Uh, it's a philanthropy. Our, our podcasts, our radio broadcasts are sent out into the world for free. Um, we are used now in hundreds of schools. So if you support what you heard here tonight, we would very much appreciate your going to our website, iq2us.org, and making a donation. Uh, it would mean make a great deal of it would mean a great deal to all of us. Um, our next debate, we're going to be in New York City on November 29th at the Kaufman Center. The motion uh, will be looking at, we'll be looking at President Obama's foreign policy legacy. Um, our panel will include military historian and a former counselor at the Department of State, Elliot Cohen, and Derek Cholet, who is a former Undersecretary of Defense. He's author of a book called The Long Game, which is described as being the closest anyone will come to understanding the thinking behind Obama's foreign policy. On December 7th, uh, we will be again partnering with the National Constitution Center. Uh, our motion will be uh, whether, we, well, I don't have a phrase as a motion. I'm telling you what the topic is. It's going to be over whether or not we should be calling a constitutional convention to amend the Constitution, which in light of tonight's discussion uh, gets even more juicy. Our debaters will include uh, Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Lessig and Mark Meckler, who is a grassroots activist and a uh, co-founder of the Tea Party Patriots. Tickets for that are still available through our website. And I do want to mention this. Um, if you can't get to our debates, and we're delighted that everybody got here. We love coming to Washington and to GW for this reason, it's to see all of you here. But you can watch our debates. Um, um, and listen to them a, a wide variety of ways. Our newest addition is that we are now available as an app on Roku and on Apple TV. So if you have Roku or Apple TV, you can just search through there. We also have an app uh, where you can watch and listen to debates on your phone through the Apple Store and through the Android Store. Um, and for all of this, just to learn more about us completely, our website has everything uh, going on there, iq2us.org. Thank you very much. Okay, I have the results now. You have voted twice. The motion is this, gerrymandering is destroying the political center. I want to remind you that it's the difference between the two votes that determines who our winner is. Let's look at the first vote. In the first vote, gerrymandering is destroying the political center. 62% of you agreed, 8% were against, 30% were undecided. The team arguing for the motion, let's look at their second vote. Their first vote was 53%, their 62%. Their second vote was 53%. They lost nine percentage points. Let's look at the team arguing against the motion. Their first vote was 8%. Their second vote was 34%. They picked up 26 percentage points. It means the team arguing against the motion, gerrymandering is destroying the political center, named our winners. Our congratulations to them. Thank you for me, John Donvan, and Intelligence Squared U.S. We'll see you next time.